I'd like to introduce Jennifer Crouch, um, who is going to present a commentary on illustrated models of the cosmos and the metaf metaphorization of nature. I should have rehearsed that. Um, having studied physics and illustration separately at university, uh, Jennifer works as a practicing artist, arts educator, and workshop provider. Um, she's a member of the Jiggling Atoms Project, a multidisciplinary project exploring the wonders of physics. Jennifer will talk about representation and abstraction. Of course, she's sorted out, got her PDF to behave. Um, she will talk about representation and abstraction in the process of knowledge creation. So maybe picking up on some things that are starting to bubble up in the, in the discussion. I will let you yeah. carry on with that rather than fill in the whole lot. So over to Jennifer. Uh, yeah, so um, images in the process of knowledge creation. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting because images have the capacity to ha contain within them a range of different meanings. So you can have, um, or you used to be able to, there used to be this kind of um, semiotic thing with roses. You'd have yellow roses mean this thing, red roses mean another thing. Um, also, you know, you make associations about certain things that people wear, certain things that people do. So somebody with a T-shirt with a math equation on it might be associated with a certain thing as opposed to somebody with a different kind of image on their T-shirt, even though it can be the same person wearing the T-shirt. Um, images have more meaning than what they literally represent is what I'm trying to say. Um, so this is just, just a couple of examples of my work. So uh, a painting called The Moss Crest Project, which took me about four years, um, it took a long time for various reasons, but um, a contributing factor was that the person that commissioned the painting ended up going to prison uh, and corresponding to me about what it was like and I would write each other letters and he'd tell me all about prison. Um, and prison is just a terrible idea and I don't understand why they still exist, but I guess it's cheap, than cheaper than you know, helping people who are doing stuff properly. Um, so there's all this kind of imagery that I... Um, and also about the kind of... So he has got put in prison for, for fraud. Um, and, I, and I wanted to kind of tell his story through the commission that he, he gave me and that his actual brief to me was make something big and make something that every time I look at it, I see something different, do whatever you want, charge me as much as you like. So I was like, OK. <laughs> and it was, a, it was the best brief ever, but also the worst. And I laboured over it and restarted it three times. Um, and uh, I think it's finished. I think I need to do a few things to it. But he's, he's, he's in this picture at the top here, but I cut him off because I, I didn't ask him whether I could put his face in it. And I think it's very hard coming back out of prison and trying to live. Um, so yeah, there's all these things that he he sort of sees as you know, these tunnels going into whatever into each other, and um, there's this sort of meaning in there. And he he when he's looking at this painting that I've done for him, he creates he's able to create his own meaning. So um, I find that a really interesting thing about art in general, that it has the ability or the capacity to um, carry multiple me meanings superposed on top of each other every single person's view and idea about what that piece of art is about um, is valid and is true and is correct um, and you know um, and Joe spoke a little bit about how this, there's this thing in art where you have this anything goes kind of um, thing where yeah it can be whatever you want it to be and that's okay because it's art and you can if you wish interpret it through a kind of um, critical I don't know philosophical edifice but you can also just have an opinion on it without knowing anything about it and that contributes to the overall social value and function of a piece of art um, it does make it very difficult if you want to make art about science and if you want to make it try and have a piece of work that says this is about a piece of science and it means something it represents a process but you still want people to be able to go and make up their own stories about it and have their own narrative um, I think the creation of narrative uh, just simply by experiencing a piece of art and just tilting your head to one side and going, yeah, it's, it's nice. And I think that's something that we should encourage, um, even if it is about science. Uh, um, so there were a few other things. So this is this hand here. I deliberately used stylized imagery to lead whoever sees this painting to, to assume that there's definitely a very specific kind of meaning behind it. Um, but I, I didn't necessarily make it very obvious what the meaning was. I just used things like hands, and hands have a religious thing. This is also to do with Star Trek. 
and there's an equation in there about stuff that happens inside a neutron star, um, also stuff about being in prison and getting you know, attacked in, in prison. Um, so yeah, Jiggling Atoms is a project that I have been working on since 2012. Um, there are two members of the audience who have helped me with it, and I'm really happy they're here. So it's good. Malte and Rosie. Where's Rosie? I don't know. Oh, there she is. Oh, she's great. Um, yeah, so the whole point of Jiggling Atoms, well, actually, is it kind of expanded, but it was about um, what can illustration, what's the role of illustration, I guess, in, um, in communicating and understanding uh, ideas that have a technical meaning behind them. Um, and it's not just representation, because a lot of the things in physics are imperceivable in perceptible, I don't know what the word is, but you can't see it. You can't, it's just impossible to see the stuff. So you have to understand, as a, you know, a scientist has to understand what's going on by interpreting data or in, interpreting how this invisible stuff um, interacts with stuff that's visible and then cre- being able to create an image through that. So we thought that illustration um, is a sort of really powerful way to, to try and get creative practitioners to think about solving or approaching that kind of problem. How do you, how do you represent something that is impossible to see, that is extremely difficult to describe? I don't have many examples of the work, but you can visit Jiggling Atoms' um, uh, website. Just Google, Google it. Um, you can give the website out as well, because it's changed since it first started. Um, it was really important for this project that we teach the contributing artists a really basic introduction to physics, because otherwise we, you, know, you can't set a brief to create work about physics unless say, here is some physics for you to learn about now and respond to it. And so the brief, very broadly speaking, was to create an exploration or an explanation of what they had learned. So in a way, it's also about um, how we learn and about how we respond, um, how creative, I guess, creative practic- practitioners respond visually to this kind of information. Um, yeah, so we also ran some workshops. The electric, electricery workshop, which was about um, using, making a home polar motor with batteries and copper wire and magnets, and you have this spinning thing, and it's kind of magic, and the interaction with physics is very instantaneous. Feynman diagram print workshop, uh, and this is the work of Peter Nencini. He responded to torsion, the torsion uh, forces that happened in certain experiments that I'll talk about later. Um, very briefly, uh, it was interesting how he extra- how he extracted information from what from what he learned. Um, so an example of uh, invisible things that are made visible is this really nice, very familiar, hopefully familiar um, thing with bar magnets and iron filings. Um, so yeah, it's it's making something that's invisible visible by seeing how it interacts with something that we know. Um, and uh, it touches. It starts to touch on sort of my main interest, um, which is just a commentary. So who knows? I might just bleh, talk stuff and not make sense. Um, but yeah. So these field lines, fields, and the word field and lines. There's no field. There's no lines. These words are metaphorical. Uh, it's interesting because they genuinely help to communicate what is going on in the scientific context as well. Um, so more jigging at some stuff we also taught at Camwell the second year graphic design and illustration courses in 2013 with Adrian who's here as well um, and I think my f- what my favourite part of it was was after teaching the physics lectures to the BA students um, was that we asked them to do a workshop where they uh, used very um, uh, unfamiliar ways of image making so uh, something more, I guess, uh, tangible, uh, sort of process-based, non-traditional forms of image making. I think this one is my favourite. It's a kind of, I guess, this is my assumption that it's a statistical metaphor. It's a metaphor for statistical things that happen when ice is melting. And they just did a big game of leapfrogs, and, and actually it works quite well to explain what's happening to a block of ice um, when the water, when, when it starts to melt. Uh, I thought I thought that was really nice because it was interactive. Uh, it had the uh, yeah, statistical element of it, so there's an element of unpredictability, which I thought was interesting. Also, the structure there. I don't, the top image, I don't know what that is, but I like it. I don't know. <laughs> oh, 
this one was great as well. It's sort of set up with these easels and this block of ice that when it melted, eventually these two easels would fall down. And it's, this is kind of metaphorical of a block of ice melting and falling apart. I don't know what's going on. Um, yeah, OK. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so other jigging atoms, workshops. I think that what is amazing about running workshops about art and science or that sort of try to bring those two things together, and it is difficult to bring those things together. So I did study physics at university uh, for three years. I didn't complete my course, but I did three years, which is fine. I didn't finish. It's okay. I'm, I'm okay with it. It's fine. <laughs> um, and then doing, then doing illustration and starting with a foundation. And undergraduate physics is... is it's difficult. There are, it, is, it is right or wrong, and it has to be right or wrong. It's a really important part of education in physics because you have to know how to do certain things. You have to know what the maths means, what the maths does, and why it is that you know, it relates to the real world. And that in itself is, is kind of amazing. It doesn't, didn't have to be the case that maths made any sense at all in connection to physical material nature of reality, but it does. And that's amazing. Um, but anyway, so it was undergraduate physicists just go home and do some maths every single day every single day that's pretty much what it was and then some time on a computer and some time in the lab and just being really tired and then doing a foundation all of a sudden I could do whatever I wanted and that was one of the most exciting things and also um, I think I mentioned it before just um, having your ideas be under such scrutiny was, I, um, I think, I think extremely. Is that okay? This thing keeps happening. I'll check the wires if it does it again. Okay. Um, yeah. So what what I'm liking about what's happening with jiggling atoms at the moment is that all of the workshops that we are doing are transformative in a way. So one that we did in 2013 at the with designers block at the London Design Festival was making radio out of household objects, so a functioning radio. So the capacitor is a um, uh, some aluminium foil and some tissue paper and it slides up and down on some paper, paper towel roll. You've got toilet paper roll wrapped up in a copper wire which is really fun because toilet paper is toilet paper and the copper wire is really shiny and it's got this nice feeling towards it, um, in it rather. And then uh, the germanium diode, we used a germanium diode there but we made our own germanium diodes as well with the aluminium razor blades that we just smoked in one end of it and made it uh, a, you know, sort of filter, really, a semiconductor, um, with a bit of carbon on the end of it. And uh, that was really exciting. And I think it was important because technology and hacking is a big thing at the moment. We always use technology and not necessarily knowing what it's about, and that's really good. Um, but it's also quite good to know, and if you really want to explain what's happening in a radio, to actually sort of scale it up somewhat. And making them out of everyday household items does scale it up, and it also sort of, this sort of black box of technology is, is just obliterated. You're just like, no, it's just materials. It's just materials interacting with each other. The electron stops a little bit, then it goes over here, and it sloshes up and down this wire, and then it, <laughs> you know, makes a sound, and it's interesting. The only radio that worked was made by a nine-year-old, which I thought was great, a nine-year-old girl. Um, also, things like uh, inventing your own zodiac, so this sort of arbitrary nature of how things are named, the arbitrariness of uh, history in general, the arbitrariness of there being 90 degrees and an angle, all of this stuff um, is sort of embodied in, in, and sort of explored in our workshops. Um, and so on the lit side was uh, in Siglafjordr, which is a place in Iceland, uh, where we made bioplastics out of a uh, chitin that would have been extracted by a plant that was near where we were, by complete coincidence. Um, chitin is a, is a polysaccharide, just like agar and just like pectin. Um, and we made lots of bioplastics out of sort of refuse. They didn't all work, but some of them did work. And the agar made quite good yogurt pots. They were, they were floppy, but that's, that's good because they took the shape of the yogurt pots. Um, so that was fun, I think. It has to be fun as well. Um, uh, and uh, the idea of transformation we got a bit carried away with. Um, so we had to do some electrolysis to make some sodium hydroxide to increase the yield of agar that you get out of cooking lots of um, seaweed, it actually works, I don't know how or why, but I don't need to know. So, and it, we found some junk in a, uh, what's it called, tip, 
<laughs> um, and we made some, and we sort of tried to bring stuff that people had thrown away back to life. So we made this was this was non scientific. It was I, I mean I think it, it kind of could be argued as science and technology, but it's just complete nonsense. Um, we made a machine that tested our bioplastics um, resistance to insult. So you would smash it with a rock on the end of one of these banana shaped things. You didn't salt the bioplastic, and this was like a workshop that we did. So people made their own bioplastics and then shouted at their bioplastics, and that was fun. And this was a, a makeup applicator. Maybe it's when you go near the board, actually. I may I just stand away from it? Um, yeah. So this this thing was a makeup applicator take, uh, made to, out of a, a VCR player that we found. Um, we took the motor out, and there's this sort of metal stick here. And we just put lipstick on the end of it and just put, give ourselves lipstick and really bad nail varnish. And it was just, it was just really silly. Let's just see what kind of, what, how, like how stupid uh, we can be by reappropriating and transforming everyday objects um, into fun things. Um, as well as this sort of serious thing about about bioplastics and you know there, there's something like I think 20 million tons of crab shells that are wasted every year and we could use this chitin for all kinds of different purposes and there was a, there was a serious message but also some fun. Um, also some of the stuff that I've been doing, uh, again uh, returning to some of this representational work, I was asked to, um, just play with my eyes. Okay. Um, I was asked to uh, paint a helmet for a charity by a company that were trying to raise money for breast cancer research and everyone was doing you know, heroes and people that fight, people that you know survive cancer, and nobody was paying any attention to any of the researchers. And it, I think it is, you know, it really was, I guess, in a way, I spent a lot of time on it, just sort of thinking about really biomedical research is, is sacred, actually. It's, it's, you know, and, and it's recently been Remembrance Day. And you know, take this comment or leave it, do what you want, but with this comment. Um, but I, I read somewhere, and also I don't know the statistics, so also it might not be completely true, but that more people have been saved by agriculture and medicine than have been killed in all the wars in history ever. And, it, and I just feel like, why isn't there a monument to Stephen Weinberg and his work that he did on cancer? It's because of him that we know a lot about cancer, and why isn't there, isn't there a party or a holiday or you know, a minute's silence for... His work, I kind of, I kind of don't, I don't understand what we've prioritised as um, in culture, and I, I, I really wish that we could celebrate some of the things that science does because it changes our world more than anything else. You know, everything that we're doing right now, using this projector, travelling, medicine, it changes the world and how we communicate and how we represent ourselves. So um, in, after graduating from illustration in 2011, I decided that I would do medical illustration because I thought it might be interesting. Um, and I was working at St George's University Hospital in Tooting between 2011 and 2013, creating uh, medical illustrations for their academic publications and for a couple of textbooks. And it's just this, this image that is very straightforward and very simple and very streamlined and very archetypal that is a functional illustration. Um, and even some of the drawings that I did just for fun. Uh, and again, thinking about modes of representation. What modes of representation do we use to say certain things? And how can an image contain extra information, like experience, like what it's, what's it like to experience um, you know, a dissection? What's it? It's, yeah? Okay. I thought you had a question. Oh, no. It's all right. If you do have a question, put your hand up. <laughs> um, you know, what's it like to, to experience this kind of thing? And really, when I was drawing in the dissecting room, um, it, it was very much like drawing a landscape. There's this sort of texture to, to tissue um, where, you know, if you squint your eyes, you could almost be a bird flying over, you know, do the rocks of Dover or something. And there's this, this texture that's sort of similar, um, but soft and squishy and made out of, out of something else. Um, so, uh, yeah, this kind of image, although I drew what I saw, and yes, I, it is my own personal style, but I still, you know, as far as I'm concerned, drew what I saw. Um, it's scientifically useless, really, in terms of, in the context of medical illustration, because it doesn't tell you about any of the structures. It doesn't tell you about anything that's going on, except for what it's like. But it's kind of like comparing, for me anyway, I don't know, it might be different for you guys, um, it's kind of like comparing a... Um, a computer model of cloud formation to a painting of a cloudscape 
they both contain completely different kinds of information, but they're both, they're both connected to the actual real form that's behind that. Um, I think that's an interesting thing, an interesting situation to be in, because it makes you sort of question about, question what it is that the thing is itself. Um, is it that the thing is actually there, or is it the idea of the thing? So the, the simulation or the, the drawing itself that, that is the thing. Is it because I'm a human that this is here, or you know, is it here anyway? I mean, I don't know. Who knows? It's a mystery. So, uh, ask questions. I don't, I don't have any conclusions at all about this stuff. This is why I want to talk to you about it, because I think it's an interesting thing to not have a conclusion about, really, and I, I like not having a conclusion about it. So my current project is that I've set up an artist in residency at the UCL Centre for Advanced Biomedical Imaging. Um, this is something that I set up myself, so it's completely unfunded, uh, which is brilliant because it gives me a lot of freedom to do what I want and to engage with the researchers in the way that I want. And the whole po the, uh, the centre, the core of the project is, is um, I think it's interesting hearing Joe as well talk about um, about her work because this project, it's fundamental this project that it is that whatever it is that we end up making in terms of art, it has to be it has to be mutual there has to be mutual creative input. I don't want to be the one that's just making art. I think the researchers have to make it too. And so I said that to them and they said, okay, well you have to be a fully integrated member of the of the lab. So it's it's nice because there's no there's no external funding and I think it, although I was annoyed about that when actually we got rejected at first, I kind of thought, you know, actually it's better because we can we can really do what we want now. We don't have to have a timeline. We don't have to. It doesn't have to be educational. It doesn't have to be public engagement. It's going to just be whatever it ends up being, and we're, we're all going to really go for it. So, um, I'm. Th they image the most incredible stuff. So the technology in this lab, um, I find phenomenal. It's like being in Nemo's submarine. You have a, a, a MRI machine that's like amazingly powerful, and you can't step too close to it. And there's all this stuff that you can and can't do, and I find that the design of the science and the way that you have to move and interact with the space is really interesting. Um, this image uh, was, I'm just going to read this out, um, was created using diffusion tensor magnetic resonance imaging. Um, the or orientation of the highly ordered muscle fibre architecture of the heart is determined by the movement of water through the fibres. So water moving through the cells. Um, so, so far I'm having, I've been really interested in how new ways of imaging have the capacity to change how we perceive ourselves as individuals. And I think the individual is an important theme in art because you know, the artist has got an exhibition and there's a poster with a name on it and there's this kind of feudal system in art which is kind of boring and I just don't, I want to destroy it, I don't like it. Um, I'm not going to destroy it but I would like to. Um, yeah, so it's interesting because because all of a sudden, and it's kind of this relates as well, well as well to okay, yeah. So I've got to finish quite quickly, even though I have more slides. Okay. Didn't even get to the metaphors. <laughs> Never mind. Um, because it, it sort of reconstructs how we perceive ourselves um, as a cellular ecosystem, and for me, having drawn from from a dissecting table. Uh, this human tissue and just suddenly seeing it in this different way this is just not how I, how, I, how I understand anatomy at all so I'm starting to see myself as kind of like a, a kind of a fiber optic thing, I don't know um, so just an interesting picture so how close uh, are the representations and abstractions of nature used by scientists uh, in order to do science using mathematics or computer models to the things they represent. And there really is quite a huge gap, but that's interesting. And I mean, this is a philosophical question to do with language and to do with, you know, the philosophy of mind and all these other things. And I feel like I'm in this big sort of soup of, of confusion, really, um, and trying to figure out how all these things relate to each other and, and actually what is it that we're going to end up making in the lab when we start making work together. Um, just a couple of metaphors. I know that I've got to stop soon. Uh, one of my favourite metaphors, uh, the solar system model of the atom. It's wrong. Atoms don't look like this, but it still really helps at communicating an idea about what atoms are like. And this uh, Bell Labs film, uh, Aims for Atom, created in 1958, um, has this great metaphor of atoms being in families, and it explains isotopes really well. Um, so I'm just going to quickly skip. These are some actual atoms. We can talk about them later, possibly. 
Um, so yeah, there are limits to perception, limits to measurement, limits to what we can understand, limits to simulation. You can have a great simulation of the digestive system, but you can't feed it pizza and see what happens. So there's this gap that's always going to be there, and I think that science really does, you know, it throws and it makes it very obvious that science is a very human thing. Um, and that's something that I want to celebrate through this residency. Um, uh, and also, question, is it possible to speak plainly about some things in nature uh, without using metaphor? I wonder whether it's possible... Uh, there, well, there are some... some truths about nature that actually we can't explain without metaphor. And I think that if, you know, if metaphor is something that is fundamental to communication in general, um, then it's something that's really important to, to think about. Um, so, yeah, I'll just, just, just mm. cut me off when it's time. But that's quite a nice one to end on. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Great. Thanks. <laughs> I think, I think some things are very difficult not to revert to, to yeah. metaphor. It is challenging. I'm going to open it straight out. Um, Dan, would you mind doing the lights? So, so questions, comments, Jennifer? Mm -hmm. Stephanie? Thank you, Jennifer. I think that was absolutely brilliant. Um, I think okay. the thing that really stands out from the whole presentation is your questioning ownership of knowledge. How are you questioning whether science is the main owner of knowledge and Art is kind of responding to that mm -hmm. or a passenger on that, people mm -hmm. are demonstrating actually that art is also a source of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I think it is though that art can and also the fact that people can go see a piece of art and invent their own, not invent, but make their own connections that may or may not have been intended. That, that's knowledge creation as well. But, it, I mean, it's also knowledge creation in terms of what it is to be a human, yes, I think. Really. And that's, you know, science in a way, the problems that scientists have in really trying to figure out what's going on, and it's very, very tricky. <laughs> I think that tells us a lot about what we are too. And, I mean, I kind of feel like um, it's it's a bit like the book Solaris in a way. It's like we're sort of, we've never, we haven't really looked at ourselves through this. We think we're looking at the universe, but maybe we're looking at ourselves. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. really you get a sort of view of, of how the people understand the knowledge you make as a scientist for example and people should understand you know I mean it's hard to people more people should understand the public understanding of science is really important because it affects our lives so profoundly um, and I mean I do believe in, in empirical truths I guess you know that some will come up and that you know I need to eat and go to the toilet and that <laughs> sort of natural natural like just stuff this is that I'm just stuck. Like that's kind of how I think about it. But there's just so much more. There's so many more dimensions to being a human. And some people have other beliefs and other beliefs. And and that's that's just that's you know you can't you can't say that one thing is right. I'm not, it's so well, it's confusing. Is there knowledge and belief? Yeah. Is there not knowledge, belief? Are they the same thing? I don't know. I mean, actually, Malcolm, <laughs> what do you think? Malcolm's a, 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 a well, like a, a researcher. So I mean, this is something that. Maybe. But I mean, as one comment that we've discussed a lot within, especially this jiggling atoms endeavor of trying to communicate knowledge, but giving it to people so they can look at it critically, was to really tell them that um, the way scientists acquire knowledge, or what they call facts, is still through a process of convincing each other that what they've done is correct. Why is that like this? Because Science, new science, is literally something that no one has ever done before. So you always have to relate the absolutely new to the stuff that you already know, which isn't the same. So it's always a discourse. Mm -hmm. So by opening this up a little bit, this scientific discourse, um, usually people feel 
much better in, in talking about it from a critical standpoint and really understanding that it's not just things are like this and other things are like this. And when we look at something new, we see it's either like this or like that. So there's always a human relationship there. And that's where I think it connects many times to artistic and cultural and social practice. Thank you. Um, thanks for your interesting talk. Um, my question, I've got two questions. Uh, one is have you worked with psychologists because if you're interested in understanding how people understand and make sense of the world, you yeah. psychologists who can help you that way. My other point relates to um, so this gentleman's yeah. talk here where we relate new knowledge to existing knowledge. That is how humans make sense of the world, mm. whether we're not only from a scientific perspective, but human understanding when we have, when, when we perceive objects, so your comment, we see things in a different, you know, we all take different perspectives from it. We do that because of our previous experiences and, and memories, and memory is associative, so it links onto previous things. So I think if you're trying to understand human understanding of a particular phenomenon, then the people you, you could engage with would be psychologists. Yeah, understand. I think that would be really interesting. And there are, there are some people at CABI who are neurologists so I'm going to have an I'm going to get them scanned and they're going to do some tests on me which is going to be really fun I can't wait to get in a machine and see what it's like but that's, yeah. that's different that's not psychology no psychology no that's about behavior no no yeah indeed no, uh, that, that was a complete segue I'm sorry um, but no that would they would be really interesting to work with I think I think I'll get there I think I'll get there eventually I think I think it's I think what I want to do um, is maybe start from maybe start from the stuff that we're made of and think about like what is this stuff that we're made of and you know there's been a, I've done a lot of work with physics there's also some work that I didn't get to talk about that I've done with the London Centre for Nanotechnology um, which is this, the stuff that they do is just completely completely wild completely crazy but really really interesting and also genuine genuinely real and I mean this I think the psychological experience of that I think is well for an outsider they're used to it but I think they, you know for me it was just like this is crazy stuff but I think working with psychology I think I'll, I'll build myself up I think I've done a lot of work in school so I think that there's a lot of different you know way, the way that people behave in different situations at different <coughs> points in life um, I'll get there I've got, I've got my whole life <laughs> one more can I ask you Jennifer about the, uh, the Moss Crest project because it's really intrigued by the painting which is, which is very beautiful yeah um, and you said that it was up to the, the interpretation was, was open. Yes. To the person who commissioned it. And I was wondering what degree you had your own narrative. Because it got, because the language and the iconography you were using is very, very specific. Yes. So I was wondering to what degree you had your own narrative, even though it's kind of open up yeah. in terms of meaning too. It was it was deliberately really specific and, and really controlled like with this very sort of this really great like really specific line work. Um, you know, with this sort of fighting with this big paint stuff and I used oils and acrylics and I smudged them all together and just made a huge mess and there is my own narrative in there and but it's completely incoherent I must admit there's like this you know, at this point and I think that this is what's fantastic about creating art is that you, you do have this freedom psychologically when you're making the work that you can start thinking about one thing and then you can start thinking about something else and I made it over a period of four years so it was a, there was a lot of different things going on and a lot of things about the work changed but I didn't want to start it again and keep starting again I thought no I'll stick with this one and just see where I go with it so the extent to which I had my own narrative I think um, was I mean it's as far as I'm concerned I had my own narrative all the way through but I wouldn't be able to, to tell you a story about it like an oval you know like there's like what the sort of surrealists had they had they had real you know there's like a code within all their imagery and there's like you know the robing of the bride on her bachelor's eve or whatever and there's meaning in there and I think mine is perhaps a little bit more sparse and confused um, maybe I'll maybe associative as opposed to like linear narrative as yeah in like if, if, because it seemed to me that quite a lot of the sim symbolism although it made reference to one another there was no explicit direction in which you had to take that path. Yeah, and I think maybe the different elements maybe are associative. So maybe there was like, you know, I'm definitely going to use a portal because this guy's trapped. And understanding why and why he ended up in the kind of prison that he did, I think, was something that I felt quite, that was kind of wrong on the behalf of the judicial system. 
Um, yeah, I just I think it was yeah they were sort of associative and 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 I think that makes it quite personal. So in a way, it's kind of impossible to understand exactly what I was saying because I can't even talk about it myself properly. Mm. <laughs> so you, I mean, there's there's that there's that. I mean, I'm just being honest. Like actually, there's incoherence in the way that I'm thinking about making work. But then you know, there's incoherence in the way that quite a lot of um, human processes associate. But sometimes it's those lateral associations that don't seem to have any kind of inherent or explicit meaning that link up or, or spawn interesting ideas. The mm. association, although it might initially be just from intuition or spontaneity, yeah. ends up yielding interesting lines of inquiry or research. Yeah. But I think that's the nice thing about using, you know, symbolism and using these images that definitely that direct people towards, you know, think about this idea and then just stop and then just let them go somewhere. Mm. So stop. Oh okay. <laughs> All right. Can we because we could come on we want to get a break and get some air and stuff. So thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> thank you.